child and the family, developmental differences, and <coughs> identify disabilities. And I just want to say a word about twice exceptional kids here. Twice exceptional kids are kids who are gifted and may have an additional exceptionality. <laughs> Perfect example of this is a child that just entered our school system. And we're discovering that not, as, not only is he quite gifted, but he has a writing disability. And so the giftedness has been masking the writing ability. And the writing ability has been kind of dampening some of his efforts at gifted and talented education and some of the struggles that have ensued from that. So it cost him some grief. Okay, in red down here, access without charge for tuition. So your district can't say to you, wow, you've got a little musical kid, go pay for lessons with uh, maestro so-and-so. Okay, it has to be without charge for tuition. And then finally, the school district board <coughs> shall provide an opportunity for parental participation in the identification and the resulting programming. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to come in for a conference, but they should be available for you to have input as a parent. You should know that your child is being served. And you should kind of have an idea of what's going on for your child. And you should feel absolutely free to ask any questions that you need to ask about services for your child. Any questions about the law? <coughs> okay. Just wanted to get that clear because some parents really don't even know that there is a law in the state of Wisconsin. May I add it's also unfunded? Okay. So it's a mandate, but unfunded. Yeah, question. I, yeah, I have a question about the uh, multiple measures. Yes. But the way you said it made it sound like one measure was enough. Was not enough. One is not. not multiple enough. measures in each category that you're looking at. So, for example, if I'm looking at academics, it might be test scores and it might be classroom performance. If I'm looking at visual and performing arts, it might be a portfolio and a teacher or parent recommendation. But it doesn't necessarily mean three different things that the kid has to get all the right scores and that. Not necessarily. And multiple hurdles. What they're saying is that we shouldn't rely on one thing alone that we should look at multiple data points on a child. Because what happens in our district is they can have a teacher recommend it, they can have a math score, they can have a, a, a parent survey, and they can have like an IQ test. And if any one of those is one point below whatever the cutoff is, you're up. I can't speak to individual districts, but maybe we can talk about that later. This is the, the intent of the law. Okay. Yes, question. Um, I know you mentioned identification starting in your kindergarten. Before yes. If the teacher decides to test the child, does the law say anything about telling the parents that that's going to occur? Oh, okay. I will tell you what my practice is, and I, I think my practice is in alignment with school law. My practice is if it's a test that all kids take, I don't need special permission. So for example, all kids take the WKCE, I don't have to ask for special permission. However, if I'm going to do a special test that only a couple kids take, like the SAGES, the Student Assessment for Gifted Educational Services, just for one child or, or two or ten, that's a special test. And I do go ahead and make sure I'm covered by having parents sign the permission slip. Good question, thank you. Okay, keep asking them. This is this is your night. All right, right now, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, are you once you're in, you're always in. Or okay. Now, in the old system, the way we used to do things, the answer was probably yes. However, if you look at needs-based, a child might need a certain service one year and then not need it the next year. That doesn't mean your child isn't gifted any longer. It simply means that your child's needs are already being met in the regular classroom. And we all know kids grow like this, don't they? They don't all just grow like that, right? 
And so some kids maybe start out really fast and then level off a little bit more. Some of my kindergartners have been using the PALS test, the new state test. Man, I like some of those kids are reading really well already. I have no way of predicting which ones, which of those kids will still be reading on that trajectory when they're in third grade. They need me now. I don't know if they'll need me in third grade. I wish I had a really good rear view mirror, you know, so I could look back and see if I was doing it. So it's needs-based. Another thing I might want to say is that some teachers are really good at lifting up the level of service for all kids in the classroom. And some teachers need some additional services beyond it. I'll tell you a little more about that right now, okay? We'll move right into that great segment. Thank you. We're under an RTI model. And RTI on the right-hand side starts for, stands for Response to Intervention. How many of you have maybe heard of that? Okay, good. About half. So I will explain it just a little bit further. Response to Intervention is, is for all kids, first of all, in Wisconsin. We have decided it's for all kids. And it's a way of meeting students' needs wherever they're at, whether it's in the mainstream of education, the next level of service at either end of the spectrum with some specialized service, or some really <coughs> specialized radical service at both ends of the spectrum for learners. This is um, being used in all school systems around the state right now. The assumption is that 80% of our gifted kids will have their needs met by your classroom teacher using differentiation strategies. And I'm going to explain what those are in a little bit. So um, know that a good teacher with some support should be able to meet a lot of kids' needs by differentiating services in a classroom. Now there's another group of kids that needs that and something else. And that something else might be cluster grouping, which means give a teacher enough highly able kids so that he or she will literally plan for those kids and do additional activities for those kids. That could mean four, five, or six gifted kids in a classroom. And in school, sometimes I show teachers how to do that. It's an effective way of putting enough kids together to make it worthwhile. And it doesn't cost any money, by the way, either. <laughs> so school districts usually like that option. Sometimes pull-out will occur at this level. These are the kids who need something above and beyond the regular classroom. They may work with a gifted and talented coordinator. They may get a chance to be in competitions like math Olympiads or science Olympiads or national ge uh, geography bees or spelling bees. They may go to the art of writing conference downtown. They're getting additional services beyond. Notice at the very, very, very tippy top of this triangle, we've got some kids who are I like to coin the phrase severely gifted, kind of an oxymoron. But these are the kids who need something so radically different that we have to do something really different for them. And it usually involves some kind of acceleration. I'll, t I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, so differentiation in the classroom, the bottom part of that triangle. What is it? How do you ask about it? How do you know what's happening? Very simply, the Association for the Supervision of Curriculum Development says it's a teacher's response to differing students' needs. That's really it. In fact, I had a teacher say to me, that's all it is? <laughs> that's all it is. Good teachers do it pretty well. At its most basic level, this is my definition, <clears throat> it means kind of shaking up what goes on in the classroom. So students have multiple options for taking in information, Okay, some of us learn auditorily, some of us learn kinesthetically, some of us learn visually. Multiple ways of taking in information. Multiple ways of making sense of ideas. Some people like to draw their ideas, some people like to write, some people like graphic organizers, some people need to act it out, some people like to look for patterns, and on and on and on. Multiple ways of doing that. And then multiple ways of expressing what you've learned. So maybe a portfolio, maybe a performance, maybe a PowerPoint presentation, maybe a wiki, maybe a blog, maybe some, something that you will share on Skype to give you lots of 21st century examples. But in a classroom like that, all learners are respected for their learning difference, differences so that everyone's needs are met. And it's, it's quite difficult to do, especially when classrooms are edging up 
in the high 20s, around 30, and some classrooms beyond 30.